The Lord be with you. I invite you to turn with me in your copy of Holy Scripture to the 8th chapter of the book of Acts. Acts chapter 8 is where we'll be this morning. Acts chapter 8, beginning with verse 26 and reading through verse 38. Acts chapter 8, beginning in verse 26. Then an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Get up and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a wilderness road. So he got up and went. Now there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of the Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, in charge of her entire treasury. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning home, Seated in his chariot, he was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, Go over to this chariot and join it. So Philip ran up to it and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. He asked, Do you understand what you are reading? He replied, How can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to get in and sit beside him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this, Like a shepherd, he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb silent before its shearer, so he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, About whom, may I ask you, does the prophet say this? About himself or about someone else? Then Philip began to speak, and starting with this scripture, he proclaimed to him the good news about Jesus. As they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What is to prevent me from being baptized? He commanded the chariot to stop, and both of them, Philip and the eunuch, went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? And now, O God, as we have come into this time of worship, as we have gathered together to celebrate baptism, to sing songs of praise, to pray for and with one another, we ask now, Lord, that you speak to us through the witness of Holy Scripture and even still the witness of your table. That your spirit proclaims to us what we need to hear this morning, to stir in our hearts in the midst of this congregation, Lord, that we may know you are here with us. So help us, God, to hear what we need to hear, that we may do what you call us to do, so that we may be the people you call us to be. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. A few years ago, I had what might mildly be called an existential crisis. That's really disproportionate to what it was, I promise. I was sitting in the movie theater with Sally. This was uh, before we had got Cole, before we brought him home. We had gone to see a very uh, thoughtful, intelligent movie called Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part Two. What was sort of the crisis for me, though, was for our entire relationship, Sally and I, we kind of marked it by going to see the Harry Potter movie. You knew another one was going to come. They wrote 18,000 books. There'd be 18,000 movies, right? But no, only seven books, and they stretched the last one, as Hollywood does now, into two movies. I was sitting there, and I didn't read the books. I just watched the movies, mostly because I had other stuff to read, but... As I was sitting there, you know when you're sitting in a movie, you can tell when it's getting close to the end, right? The music changes, enough people have either moved or died or enough people are left. And as I was sitting there, I thought to myself, what are we going to do after this? I mean, what what else is there? This can't be the end of of the story, right? Is Sally going to leave me now? Like, we can't go see Harry Potter anymore. What's going to happen? I had the same thought, uh, as you all, I'm sure, have seen that classic masterpiece, Return of the Jedi. 
uh, as they're burning Vader's body on the funeral pile, and it goes up, you know, Ewoks are dancing around, beating on stormtrooper helmets, celebrating skies filled with, you know, space, depending on which version, of course, you know, you see. And I remember thinking, is that the end? What happens now? I mean, we've only gotten one movie with, with Luke in a green lightsaber. What happens next? Now, they've answered that question, but you all know in December we'll have to ask it again because it'll be the last Star Wars movie again. Same thing when I read the Lord of the Rings trilogy the first time. This is all, by the way, just confessing how much of a dork I am. It's okay. <clears throat> I read Return of the King, and, and, and closing the book is any good book when you read it. Is it over? Is that it? Our imagination sort of takes off, right, and starts writing the story of the people who were there left at the end. Because any good story, any good thing, doesn't just end. And so I've often wondered why, at least when I was sort of coming up uh, in the church as a, a late teenager, young adult, why we always sort of treated baptism like the end. I heard a man tell me one time when I was preaching in college, he said, I want you to remember this one thing, Chris, you grow up, you're going to become a preacher. He said, it's the preacher's job to get folks saved. It's our job to drag them to church. That's what he said, drag. I hope none of y'all were drags here today. As if it were the end. We even say it, don't we? Saved. It sounds so final. As if it were the end. But you all know. Samuel knows what happened this morning. That's not the end. It's what? The beginning. That's why I, I, I sort of wonder why Luke tells this story the way he does. About this eunuch. Doesn't give him a name. Just tells us where he's from. Uh, well, his condition, let's just say that. Uh, who he works for. What he's doing. And we hear that Philip is sort of dragged by the Holy Spirit up to his chariot, baptizes him in the water, and then nothing. As if it were the end. It makes my mind do what, what our, our Jewish friends call midrash. Uh, it's when you start wondering, asking, uh, speculating, what else happens in the story to sort of stretch your mind and your faith a little bit. I do that. I wonder, where, where did this unit go? Is he one of the first Christians down in Ethiopia? One of the largest, earliest churches. Was in Ethiopia, was this one of the founders of that church? I don't know, scripture doesn't say. I wonder. See, it's not his end. It's his beginning. It's the truth we all ought to remember, especially those of us who have been through that water, that baptism is not the end. It marks the beginning of a changed life of faith. And it's a change that sort of springs forth from well, curiosity. And curiosity germinates into this search for something more. It's never just enough by itself. Albert Einstein once said this. He said, curiosity has its own reason for existing. One cannot help but be in awe when he contemplates the mysteries of eternity, of life, of the marvelous structure of reality. This is the E equals MC squared guy, right? It is enough, he says, if one tries merely to comprehend a little of this mystery every day. And then he says this. If I were the tattoo-getting kind of person, I might get this somewhere. Never lose a holy curiosity. I think that's pretty good. It's curiosity that it's that itch we need to scratch, right? And here we see it in the eunuch, don't we? He's just come from Jerusalem, probably a pilgrimage, and maybe Passover, maybe one of the big feasts. He's ridden there with the Candace, the queen of Ethiopia. He's come there, and they're heading back home, and maybe she stopped off at, at, at the Star Mart for something, I don't know, but he's there in the chariot waiting for her to come out, reading, like you all do when you're waiting on somebody, the prophet Isaiah. And he's struck, he's curious. Who in the world? Who in the world is the prophet talking about? He wants to know. But now he, there's no one there. He doesn't call out to anybody. He just wants to know. Isn't it interesting, this man, who Luke does tell us, Ethiopian from Africa, skin as dark as the suit I'm wearing, a eunuch, a sexless man, 
there, castrated because of his role in the, in the palace of the Candace, who by Deuteronomy standards is not allowed into the temple to worship, is coming back from Jerusalem, likely having seen the Candace go worship, at least paying some obligatory notion there, waiting again in the chariot, reading this scripture. Who's the prophet talk about? What was all this hullabaloo in Jerusalem? What's going on here? It's that curiosity that provokes him, that calls him on. It's something I think is healthy to keep curiosity and always questioning, never settling for the certainty, never being just satisfied with the answer you've been given. Or someone could have walked up to the chariot and said, well, I'm sorry, according to Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 1, you're not allowed to know. You're not allowed. See, you're a eunuch. You're not supposed to be involved in all this. Just sit here patiently, quietly. You just wait. But still, he's curious. He wants to know. What was it that piqued your curiosity? What was it that made you wonder, what's it like? Did you want to know what it looks like behind the wall? Did you wonder, what, what does Jesus mean in all those red letters? What is all that about? What is it that made Daddy different from everybody else? What is it that makes those folks who give up their time, not just on Sunday morning, but in the middle of the week, middle of the night? What's different about them? What was it that was just a scratch? I'll tell you what it was for me. Why in the world do those people in that building care one lick about me? I'm not related to them. I have nothing to give them. What was it? That curiosity makes us want to know more, long for more. And here, this eunuch wants to know more. Curiosity in the divine, these things that are greater than ourselves, that call us, that calls us to search for more. It's this resonance within our souls, longing after a God who is almost all the way knowable, but still calling us. And as that curiosity drives us on, thank God others come along beside us to show us the way. I think about one of my favorite, I guess he's just a well, yeah, musician, guitarist of all time, Stevie Ray Vaughan. Have you ever seen Stevie Ray Vaughan? Like, dude could play the guitar while changing a guitar string. It was amazing. Do you know who got him interested in the guitar? His brother Jimmy. Seven years older than Stevie Ray, he bought a guitar and started playing it, and Stevie Ray was just looking at him going, what's that? How do, you, how do you do that? And Jimmy showed him, well, this is how you hold your fingers, and this is how you pick and pluck the strings, and this is how you strum a chord, and this is how you do this. Oh, yes, until eventually Jimmy gave him his guitar and went and bought another one. And I'd say Stevie Ray laughed at him. <laughs> Thank God people come along beside us when we're curious. No, go away, little Stevie. I'm, this is too important. I don't have time to tell you all about this. I, you'll figure it out when you get older. Let somebody else teach you. Thank goodness. Somebody comes along. No, you, it, this is too complex. You don't really need to know what all these parables are about yet. You, 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 wait till you get a little bit older. Wait till you learn a little bit more. You don't need to know. And who brings those people alongside us? God. The Holy Spirit. Philip is just minding his own business. When an angel of the Lord says, get up, I always think he's sitting there on the corner eating sunflower seeds or something, I don't know. Get up. Go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza, a wilderness road where probably there ain't a lot of folks and it's probably real dangerous, like that certain road Jesus talked about from Jericho to Jerusalem. Get up and go there. So he got up and went and he ran out to the chariot. What you reading? I don't know, something about... From a prophet. Who's he talking about? I don't know. He comes alongside, literally comes alongside the chariot and guides this eunuch, telling him the good news of Jesus, showing him the way. I wonder who came alongside you when you started asking questions? When you started wondering, 
What is it? Why, why do we, why do we eat a little cracker and drink a little cup of juice some Sunday mornings? Why do some people get dunked under the water? Why are some folks different? Why do some folks act and live like their life isn't their own? Who came alongside you and said, now, son, this is what it is. Sister, this is what it is. Take a minute. This is what Fred Rogers used to do anytime he, he gave a commencement speech. He'd say, just take a minute. Think about that person right now who came along beside you. They might be sitting next to you. They may not be here on this side of eternity anymore. But who came alongside you and showed you the way? Who did God bring up when you said, what is this about? Who is he talking about? Who was it? You see, this life of faith, this isn't a road we walk by ourselves. Some have said, we're all really just walking each other home. That's what we're doing. It's not a solitary road, not even from the beginning. There are those who come alongside us, those who show us, those who call us. And as they walk alongside us, we find ourselves believing. And when we believe the good news, we respond not with just some nod of the head, okay, I believe it, but we respond with joyous obedience and baptism, beginning this changed life of faith. Isn't it odd? We don't mark a lot of things in life that way, do we? When we start to, to think differently, to believe differently, to live differently. But as Christians, we mark it with baptism. The closest thing I, I guess I would imagine before I ever knew anything about I was in the, the, the fifth or sixth grade, some of you may remember, uh, the Major League Baseball went on strike. What was it, 94? And so all the little local city leagues, we couldn't use Major League Baseball brands anymore, so we had to come up with, we had to use minor league team names, and I think I played on the Wizards. Uh, I remember our uniforms were black, and in South Alabama, that's not fun. Um, but my friend Roy, uh, uh, Ron Parker and some others were on a team called the Buzz. They had cool uniforms, had a big wasp on the front of them, pinstripes, black pants. But the Buzz, they were number one, we were number two. Um, we'll talk about that later. Um, but they had won like three or four games in a row. And what we heard about the Buzz was not only were they good, but they all liked each other. They all liked playing with each other. They all had fun. So you know what they all did? To show everybody else, not to intimidate us, but to show us how much they liked being on the same team together, the Buzz got buzz cut. Every last one of them went down to the barbershop. They made the sports page of the Enterprise Ledger. That's a big newspaper, y'all, or it was. You know. They shaved their heads. Front, and there it was, sports section, all of them there, to show how much they were in this together. Isn't that what that is? Isn't that what the water, what this table is? That we're all in this together? Isn't that what this is to show that, yeah, now we're all part of the same thing? We don't walk it alone. We're responding with celebration of the supper, celebration in the water. Look, and it doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. If you're sprinkled as a baby and fed wine and a wafer from a guy in the clerical garb at the rail of a Catholic church, if you're dunked in a, in a cattle tank, under some tent out in Texas, but some guy red-faced and sweating and shouting at everybody and then giving a little shot of Welch's and a little jeez it at the end. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you're in this room, dunked in that pool that's heated by a nice water heater, and you're eating these crackers, drinking gr It doesn't matter. The water and the table say to the rest of the world, hey, we're in this together. We don't do this alone. We're in this together. It's an outward sign we used to say of an inward change, but I think, I don't think that's enough. It's a sign that says to the rest of the world, hey, this church, yeah, sometimes it's messy. Sometimes we don't get along, but don't, we don't all get along with everybody in our family. It says to the world, we're in this together. You don't have to know what it all means. There's nothing magical about that water. There's nothing, well, there's some good stuff, I guess, but there's nothing magical about the bread on this table. And even if you think there is, 
still come. We're all in this together. That's what it means. And when we believe that together, we rejoice. We can't help but do it. We can't help but shave our heads and say we're all in this together. We can't help but be sprinkled, dunked, or whatever else to say we're all in this together. We can't help but say this is the Lord's body broken for you because we're all in this together. We can't help but say this is the cup of Christ, the blood of Christ shed for you because we're all in this together. That's what it says. And so, here this Ethiopian eunuch sees a little pool of water. Hey, man, what keeps me from being baptized? Now, this is, this is the Chris Thomas translation. Not a darn thing. Not a thing keeps you from being baptized. And so, we're just told simply that Luke baptizes the Ethiopian and moves right along. But it's not the end. It's the beginning. So are you curious? Do you wonder what it means? What this table means? Who's coming along beside you? Who are you coming along beside to show and to say, hey, at the end of the day, what this all means is we are all in this together. And there is nothing, not a single thing under the sky God hung up there, not a single thing that keeps you from coming to the water, but from coming to the table. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, and giver of the Holy Spirit, as we come now, Lord, to your table, we pray that your spirit continues to move among us, to speak to us, Lord, to call out our curiosity, questions we have, Lord, not that they may be finally and fully answered, but that they may call us ever on, call us more into this life of faith. Help us, Lord, to look for those who walk alongside us. Help us, God, to listen to your spirit as you call us to walk alongside others. For Lord, at the end of the day, what these times together in worship mean is that we are all in this together with you, our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.